I'm sure if you talk to anybody that's successful today, they had doors slammed in their faces and just did not let it deter them. So you never, ever give up your dream. You let them tell you at the end, it's not going to happen. You just don't say, oh, well, it's probably not going to happen because then you're defeated. Underdog stories are happening all around us, not just in the movies or on TV. There are people out there beating the odds and overcoming adversity every single day. And on this podcast, we're bringing those stories to light. This is Tyler O'Shea, and you're listening to Hustle and Motivate. Today's episode of Hustle and Motivate is presented by the Underdog Newsletter, a short, bite-sized rundown of the best underdog stories in sports, hand-picked and delivered to your inbox every Tuesday. Each week, we dig into the deepest corners of the sports universe to bring you the stories that don't always grab the national headlines. Articles, videos, and podcast interviews with the long shots, role players, and underdogs beating the odds. To sign up, just go to jokermag.com slash newsletter. That's jokermag.com slash newsletter. Sal Tartaglia always loved baseball. Ever since watching his first World Series as a fifth grader, he became fascinated by the Fall Classic. On team bus rides as a teen, his friends would challenge him with all sorts of facts. Then, in 1986, he began documenting every World Series on an old IBM Selectric typewriter. More than 30 years later, that little side project turned into his first published book, World Series Chronology. In our conversation, Sal talks about the many challenges he faced over that period of time, from the self-publishing process to the various creative marketing tactics he's used to promote the book on his own. Here is Sal Tartaglia. All right, so can you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? All right, my name's Sal Tartagli. I'm originally from the city. We moved to Drexel Hill when I was very young and met my wife who uh, came from Overbrook to Broomall, and we settled in Broomall because of the school district really good. So we raised a couple children. My daughter's at Penn now doing her master's. My son just started Penn State, Maine about two months ago. So uh, temporarily, we're empty nesters, and uh, I, uh, I got into this uh, book writing thing as a hobby, and People kept telling me you should write a book. And, uh, you know, a lot of us have heard that, I guess, from time to time. And it goes in one ear and out the other. But as uh, as it got uh, gaining some momentum through the years, I started to uh, look at it in a different light. And, and I thought that there was possibilities. So about four years ago, I really started to think seriously. Although this started, this project started as a hobby long before that. But about four years ago, I started to think of it as a uh, potential for a publication, which uh, happily I'm able to say that it finally happened for me this year. Yeah, it's amazing. The, the book is World Series Chronology for those that do not know. Yeah. Um, so when do you first remember being fascinated by the world of baseball and, and statistics and all that stuff? In, in 1967, I, had a, um, I was in fifth grade. Um, I had a teacher. His name was Mr. Blanford. And uh, he brought a television set into the classroom for us to watch the World Series. And uh, that year it was the Cardinals and the Red Sox. And it was a fabulous seven-game thriller. And I was hooked from the door. <laughs> I mean, I already knew about baseball and everything. But once – because you couldn't see them as, as a youth because uh, there were day games back then, you know. So unless somebody did something like this for you, you heard about them in the news or from your father. But um, so I immediately uh, – I believe that was a life – altering event for me and uh, probably had a lot to do with me, you know, writing this. When I actually started to put these, um, you know, letters, numbers, and words and all together as a hobby around 1986, I remember um, from 1903 to 1986 at the time, I wrote down, it was just a rough draft and it was done on an old IBM Selectric typewriter, as a matter of fact. And, uh, you know, all I did was a pretty, um, no frills um, uh, notations about who was in the World Series, how many games it went, who won it, you know, that type of thing. So um, I really got interested. I remember as a ball player, um, my teammates and I, we'd be on a bus and uh, on our way to, you know, an away game, I'd, um, I would, they knew about my 
you know, knowledge and, and, uh, they would challenge me and I, cause I would, I, you know, I would offer the challenge. I'd say, well, give me a year to, uh, and I'll tell you who was in the world series, how many games it went and one, you know, uh, major factor that stood out that maybe changed the series or ended the series or whatever, you know, for instance, like Buckner's, uh, you know, error, even though yeah. it didn't end the series that right then and there, that was a major, you know, point that stood out. So, um, that's how it began. And then, uh, Later, you know, as an adult, uh, I would I continued on the computer, and from the original, I had loose papers, post its, all kind of stuff. You know, I tried to put together and um, scan the photos into the computer because I was very, very raw, well, and I still am. I, I can navigate, but I mean, I'm not. I'm still a novice with respect to a lot of this technological uh, advances we have. So I got it into a binder form, to some sort of organization. And, uh, and then I went from there. And then I thought I was close at that point. I really did. I had no idea. I had years to go. <laughs> and uh, every time, of course, when it wasn't ready to get published, or I couldn't get an agent to look at it or anything, I still it was all rough draft anyway, I would have the next World Series to pop up. So, because, uh, you know, eventually, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I would have liked to have ended it at a certain time at the end of the century. And it would have been all the 1900s, you know, a nice closed uh you know uh format but as it continued then i thought okay when we got to the hundredth world series you know when the Sox uh got there after uh coming back from zero three in the uh in the acls anyway it continued and went on and on and in a way it was good it was a blessing in disguise because there was a lot of mistakes and every year when i added to it we had to you know re-edit it and when i tell you before i hired a printer I literally, you know how they have cut and paste options. I literally, with scissors and a glue stick, cut and paste <laughs> and then made copies and then would bring those copies to Staples. And I, these books were very raw in the beginning. And it's a good thing I wasn't able to put them in anyone's hands because they would have looked at it. Even though the content was fabulous, they would have looked at the pictures and been deterred, I'm sure. So, And I purposely, even after I got to a certain point, I purposely left the pictures in like from the 1900s to like the thirties. I left them old and grainy because in your mind's eye, this is how you see those years. And all of my um, critics said, you know, family members, whatever they said, no, no, change that. That looks, I said, no, that's my design. I want that to be that way. So anyway, after I got all these pages together, um, I thought to myself, It'll be a shorter task if I just go ahead and add from 1987 on in computer, in Word. And then everything previous was typewritten on an old typewriter. And I thought, well, eventually I'll find some software like Adobe Reader that would uh, convert it all. And the theory was good. <laughs> but when I first, when I first did it, Letters were coming out like percent signs, um, pound signs. I mean, they, every every you oh, it was it was it was a uh, was a nightmare. So eventually, I found the proper software. Um, I knew it, it would probably be better because it didn't match. You know, it would probably be better if I went back and started it over. So, but before I did that, I thought I was ready. You know, <laughs> hard headed me. So I got the rough drafts together in book form from Staples, and uh, I sent these early versions to publishers, agents, university presses, you know. And um, as raw as it was, Darren's Publishing in Pittsburgh had accepted my manuscript. I, did, I chose not to go with them because they wanted fees. And I was told that if there's merit to your work, it should be, you know, based on percentage. Uh, they'll take a certain amount of whatever sold. So I never went there, although I was proud of that. And, you know, I was accepted by a publisher finally, but I could never get any agents to take a look. So I started to pound the payment. And, uh, I had a friend, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar, Damon Fellman. He uh, promotes those uh, celebrity boxing matches. He's in the news mm -hmm. a lot. And uh, he suggested that I, you know, start boning up on my social media and everything and at the time, because I had no pages or anything like that. You know, it's funny, the connections you make through unlikely sources. Uh, my brother-in-law is a um, 
he does remodeling his construction. Uh, and he's an artisan. I mean, he does things by hand that you normally would buy, you know, like mantles for fireplaces, aprons for your chandelier. He does these things by hand. Anyway, he had a customer and his name was Mike Malo. And he was a retired editor from Philadelphia Magazine. So I brought my work to him. I needed, you know, I needed some criticism. You know, I needed to know what I was doing wrong and whatever. So that was uh, that was the first person in the the industry, so to speak, that I spoke to. Then um, I was uh, worried about losing my material and the, the format that I made it in, even though a lot of it was public domain. So. I had to get copywritten, and a friend of mine introduced me to Bob Bush, who had some radio connections. And he uh, thought he could get me on WIP, and I'm just trying to get a hold of Cataldi and all them guys from WIP. And every time you mail something, you know, someone else signs for it, and they never get the book. So I stopped sending books, and I just started sending letters, like pitch pages, you know, uh, the, the description of the book itself in synopsis form. and. Uh, so I finally had Bob Bush uh, uh, help me to uh, copyright it. So I was proud of that achievement. I was in the Library of Congress. You know, I would live forever in posterity, regardless if the book ever made it anywhere. So um, I continued to, uh, you know, try to, to like get a hold of ex Phillies because I would see like uh, Mickey Morandini and my son, Mickey Morandini's son and my son played baseball against each other in middle school. Uh, Morandini was Garnet Valley, I believe, and my son played at Paxton at the time before going to Marple. So, you know, I was just trying to, at the time, I was trying to get help with getting exposure and, and maybe, you know, somebody suggested to a uh, in an agent, you know. I continue to do this to this day, but now not so much for that as I just like their opinion because I respect, uh, you know, what they know about the game. So, I continued to try to get it to people at, you know, Comcast Sports, WIP. When Damon Fellman uh, invited me to a press conference that they had for Larry Holmes, and uh, it was one of Damon's celebrity fight things, but Larry was lending his name to it to give it credibility. And it was down at Chickies and Pete's in South Philly. And uh, I went down, and uh, there was a, wasn't too many press members there. As a matter of fact, they assumed everybody was because of the lack of, uh, you know, um, um, asses in the seat, so to speak. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I actually got to interview, uh, not interview, but, uh, you know, pose a question to Larry. And I asked him, and it's a shame. I had this on video and I deleted it. And I, I regret that to this day. But I asked him if he regretted it when he went up against um, uh, Michael Spinks. And at the time, his record was 48 0. And, you know, he was getting ready to go 49 0. If he had won, he would have tied. Rocky Marciano for, you know, the best record heavyweight division. And he was talking about uh, rock couldn't hold my jock. And I remembered that. So I asked him about it and he was very contrite and backpedaled somewhat and said, I was taken out of context. I have all the respect in the world for he's one of the Kings of the game, blah, blah, blah. So because he was that way, I, I didn't go further because I was going to say, well, do you think it had anything to do with a dubious distinction instead of holding that record? You were the only heavyweight to ever lose the title to a light heavy. But I, again, I, <laughs> I, I refrained. I didn't go that far. So anyway, at, at this particular um, uh, press conference, I met Jack McCaffrey from Delaware County Times. Yeah. And I talked to him about my book a little bit. He said, send me a segment. Uh, and I was just starting to get real savvy with email and whatnot. So I was able to uh, digitally just send him one chapter. Um, and I'll get to that later. Uh, my book differs in a lot of ways. And one of the ways is the chapter I sent him. It deals with the crime rate uh, of a city after winning uh, a world title. So when I sent it to him, he gave me a little write-up in the paper on uh, Saturday, July 18th. I have it right in front of me. <laughs> and he gave me uh, his back, the back page of the sports, which is the front page of the sports, really. Uh, he gave me a tiny little segment because he his uh, – his uh, article, Insight, Inside Sports, I don't get it. There's a combination of about five or six different little small articles. So I was one of them. So I was proud of that. You know, uh, Damon had helped me connect with uh, my first media personality, so to speak. So, uh, again, with regard to the uncanny and unlikely connections you make 
on a job one time. I was uh, pouring concrete for a company called Ajon's Local. I can't remember the gentleman's last name, but his name was Kevin. And, um, you know, I, I start to bring up the book. I'm starting to get momentum, I'm thinking, because I, you know, with article in the paper and all, I'm starting to get a little, you know, proud of myself. So I mentioned it to people. And, and uh, you know, I told this guy, I can't seem to get an agent to look at it or, you know. And he mentioned that the, he had a friend that self-publishes. And, you know, at the time, I used to think of self-publishing as a step down, like V-League. Of course, since then, I found out that, you know, even the big five publishing houses, uh, Random and Penguin, um, you know, they're involved in this too because it's, it's a major mar- part of the market they don't want to miss out on. So anyway, this gentleman's name is Dan Curran. And I went to visit with him and showed him my book and he liked it and told me at the time, I think he had about six books published. And uh, he said, Sal, listen, uh, you know, I'm not breaking the bank. He said, but I, I make a living doing this. So I was like, oh, great. So um, I started to think of it in terms of, you know, um, whether it be Kindle or whatever. I started to use that as a, uh, a basis for a personal possibility. So um, at this point, I happened to be at the theater in Edgemont, which is close to me. I live in Broomall. And Michael Barkham from Comcast Sportsnet, you know, he lives in Newtown yeah. Square. It's a neighboring town. So I bumped into Mike and his wife. I was with my wife also at the Edgemont Regal Theater. And I spoke to him about, you know, what I was trying to do. And, of course, I had already mailed it to him, and he never got it. You know, he mentioned to me that Ray Dinger wrote a play called Tommy and Me, and um, that he was going to be down there and, uh, you know, possibly, possibly, you know, maybe I'll get a chance to talk to Ray. So I went down on Delaware Avenue. I forget the name of the theater. And um, there was a QA and a after the, t- the – pl- and the play was excellent, by the way. Ray, Ray deserves being in the Hall of Fame more than just for being a journalist. I mean, this guy, he's really good. Um, after the play, there was a Q&A, and I waited till after that. And as everybody started to filter out, I walked up to Mike, introduced myself again, shook his hand. He sh- introduced me to Ray, and I was able to put my book in Ray's hand. And it was a turning point of things for me at that, at that juncture. Ray took his time, loved the content. Again. I didn't have the early photos uh, enhanced yet. You know, the resolution was still poor. But again, that was something I thought was valid. So I think that may have been a deterrent. But in any event, he still said that the content was fabulous. Passed it on to Temple Press, uh, Aaron Javiscus. um, And it took a good six weeks, two months. And he respectfully declined, said they were going in a different direction. But they gave me a lot of suggestions. So at least they, finally I was getting people in the know to take a look at it. Cause that's all I ever wanted. Look, if it's not good enough, somebody just tell me. And uh, they all liked the content. They said it was, you know, different than anything that they read on the subject. So um, I, I finally hired a printer. And of course this was another trial and everything. Um, I went around every copy place I saw and all I would go in and ask for prices. And of course it was out of my range. (laughs) So it was a place on 452 and I forget the name of it right there, route one and 452. And they suggested a place called media copy and it was in media, Pennsylvania. And I went there and I met a gentleman named Juan Torres and uh, he had the same passion that I did for this project. So that's why I really wanted to mention him. Uh, after it got to be palatable to the eye, I presented it to Kindle. And of course you had to format it a certain way. And, uh, there were certain things that we made as a PDF, so you couldn't edit it. You know, it wasn't an actual yeah. text thing. Some of it was in Word, some of it wasn't. So I learned from that. The next project won't be that way. It'll be all the same way where I can edit it digitally. But, um, anyway, um, Amazon, told me what was wrong, what I needed to do. And uh, uh, a friend of mine from work, his name is Alex Haunt. He was very, very savvy with the computer. So he helped me present this back to Kindle in such a way where, you know, it goes through stages before it's accepted. I knew grammatically because of all the editing going back and forth, because every year there'd be a new World Series. So I had to add to it. And of course, it changed some of the statistics 
you know, like if it was a, a team that swept somebody that added to that category, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or if they won a hundred games on a regular season, it added to that category. There's a lot of categories in the book. So anyway, um, I knew that grammatically it would pass muster and it did. Of course, they have a legal team to go over for any infringement and I passed that. So everything was a go and we finally got it live. I think it was uh, May or June of this year. So, um, it's been live for a while. I had to self promote, um, on the suggestion of, uh, certain people. I, uh, started, you know, social media, Facebook pages, Instagram, whatnot. And, uh, I have uh, I have a couple different pages. One's World Series chronology, and then uh, one's more Philly centric. It's uh, it's about the Phillies and the A's, any kind of Philadelphia baseball over the you know the entire uh, history. My brother Chris uh, helped me to uh, run these. Actually, he takes more of a hand in the uh, Philadelphia one now because I'm concentrating on trying to put the uh, World Series one on blast. So it's like uh, self promoting advertisement for free. Um, I was fortunate enough to connect with other baseball pages and you know through your comments and all they see that there's some guys that just don't know what they're talking about and some that do so they recognized me through my comments on their pages and then they would kind of invite them to mine and this one thing led to another and a few of them made me administrators and i like to mention one guy uh, bill sherry and his baseball page is called baseball for the love of the game and he's out of arizona and he's got about 12,000 followers. So by making me an administrator, my post on my page automatically can go to his and it automatically spreads to all those people that he has looking at his page. So it was like free advertisement. So that was very nice to have. So uh, little by little, I was still trying to, you know, get my foot in the door for some real advertisement because I have limited funds, you know, I'm a regular guy, worker. Again, this Damon Feldman gentlemen <laughs> he suggested that i talk to a lloyd remick and uh, lloyd remick is a uh, philadelphia attorney but he's also an entertainment agent and he i don't know if he owns or his offices are on the entire 62nd floor of one penn center square off of jfk and he invited me up to talk with him and uh you know, he, he need like 2500 just to retain this guy. So he did me a favor. Um, he looked at it. It was like, a, you know, like the taxi driver that puts the meter down, you know. <laughs> he looked at it, yeah. gave me about 10 minutes of his time, liked what he saw, suggested a few things I do, people I contact, and, uh, you know, get back to me. So um, I made some improvements, and then I, I mailed – a copy to him as a quote unquote gift. So it really wasn't part of, you know, any type of arrangement or contract or work, you know, for fees. Mm-hmm. So he told me, if you continue to promote this on social media, he said, this was like July. He said, come back to me around September. I'm going to try to get you on the radio. So in about four months time, with the help of these other baseball pages, my self-promoting, my, the boosting you can do from Facebook for a small figure, all these things, I wound up uh, acquiring approximately 5,000 more invites, likes, and um, viewers. So I was getting the word out. When I came back to him, he got me in touch with Joe Ball at Act Incorporated. It's an advertising agency. And he got me uh, an interview. Uh, on uh, the 31st of October, the day after the World Series ended, by the way, perfect timing, on WWDB with D. Lyman, former Sixer coach Jim Lyman's daughter. So we had the interview. Everybody liked how it went. I was invited back, publish anything else or make adjustments to this, which I will, by the way. Um, during the summer, I put together a website, worldseriesconology.com. And right now, it's kind of bare bones. I mean, I, I blog daily just to whet the appetite of the reader. I don't want really to give the book away, you know what I mean? So it's just little bits and pieces of what they could see if they purchased. I don't per- uh, You can't purchase the book on the site yet, but once I upgrade it to, I will. And what I'm going to do is digitally, 
make the enhancements because now that the book's published, I'm not going to republish, reprint, I should say. But the uh, addendums, like for instance, from this World Series, All Road Wins, first time ever. Um, how it correlates to the Twins, who had all home wins in their World Series. And by the way, the Twins were the former Washington team. So that connection, that's the type of things you see in my book, these oddities, I call them. Do you want to talk about that? Because you mentioned earlier the, the cool facts like, you know, the effect of winning a World Series on the city's crime rate and stuff like that. What did you what did you do to make your book different? OK, well, that chapter 10, I devoted completely to the uh, the effect a uh, winning a world championship has on the city's crime rate. And I did it prior to this. Um, it was a thesis of mine when I was a Villanova student and I keep everything. And for some reason, I could not find this paper. So I called around to all these cities that, you know, during the seventies teams that won Oakland, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, Baltimore. And yeah, they had this information, but it was prior to everything being digitized. So they had it archived and they invited me to come to their chambers of commerces and, and look at them and copy them myself. But I couldn't afford to take these trips and I couldn't afford the time or losing, you know, uh, time away from work to go. So on a whim, I said, you know what, just let me take another decade. And I took the most recent decade at the time, it was 2000, 2009. And lo and behold, the same thing panned out with the exception of the first time the Sox won. Um, and let's face it, they can be excused because it was 86 years. <laughs> <laughs> but every year a city a, a team wins the World Series, the following year that city's crime rate drops dramatically, including uh, violent crime. Everything just drops. It's crazy. But um, other things uh, that make this book different is uh, things that you would normally find in normal publications. Like, let's say, even if the baseball encyclopedia was still being published, which, of course, it's not. The Coens and the Neffs have retired. but. Uh, you might be able to find, for instance, uh, the Yankees won five um, con uh, consecutive World Series in 1949 to 53. The closest franchise to come to that was the Oakland A's in 1972 to 74. Um, now, you could probably find that. Well, I'm sure you could find it, but you might have to look on page 900 and page 1240 to find it with a lot of, you know, extensive research. I did the research for the reader. It's all on the same page. And not those, just those two franchises, but all consecutive champions. Like they've won two in a row in each league. It's, it's listed. So uh, uh, I, I, I have things of like that nature that uh, rematches, how many sweeps there have been, the years they took place, um, teams that dominated a decade, you know, each decade from – you know, 03 to 09, 1910 to 19, 20 to 29, all up to the present. Rivalries, who met the most time. Um, again, these things can be found in other publications, but not as conveniently as, 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 uh, as I present in the book. Um, but really strange things that you're never going to find in any other book anywhere is... Um, on my pages, every chapter has a couple footnote pages, and uh, it'll take one salient thing from the world's. Because let's face it, this, is, this isn't this isn't a story. This isn't a reader per se, but it's more than just statistics. Uh, I, I guess you could categorize it as a coffee table book, but more so than that, because it gives you all the information just as in, in synopsis form. Um, so getting to that, like I said, uh, one odd thing, uh, there was a, a delay in the 1911 World Series between the Philadelphia Athletics and the New York Giants. And the whole eastern seaboard was deluged with rain. So you couldn't go to New York or Philly. So you just had to wait it out. So that dubious record was broken in 1989. So. 78 years later, and 3,000 miles across the continent in San Francisco, an earthquake delayed the World Series for 11 days, 11 days instead of six days. It broke the record. So like I said, it took almost 80 years and 3,000 miles across the entire United States, but it, 
it existed between the same two franchises. Only now, instead of playing in Philadelphia and New York, the Athletics played in Oakland and the Giants played in San Francisco. So a weird, dubious distinction followed these teams, you know, almost a century later. Um, there's a lot of other weird little things. Um, like 1960, when the Yankees lost to the Pirates, even though they outscored them 55 to 27, you know, they would beat them 12 nothing, 10 1. And then the Bucks would win, win games like 3 2, 5 4, you know. So the last one was sort of a barn burner because they both scored a lot of runs. But um, the odd thing that, that, that stands out to me, and of course I listed it, was that uh, in the ninth inning of that game, Bill Mazeroski, number nine, leading off the bottom of the ninth, the game tied at 9-9 nine, nine each. <laughs> He's the one that hits the homer. So I don't know if anybody's in the numerology, but all those nines just jump off. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, one last one. I don't want to bore you with these, but uh, uh, in 1912, the Red Sox beat uh, the Giants in a World Series. They lost a game seven in extra innings as a result of two drop balls by guys named Fred Snodgrass and Fred Merkle. Okay. I don't want to go into detail what happens, but that's how that led to that loss. They were, they were in a tie game and extra innings. And these two guys named Fred dropped balls in 1924. Fate played a similar joke on the giants because again, in the last inning of the last game, <laughs> A guy named Fred Lindstrom made two errors. So, so, so the Giants should never hire a guy named Fred again. <laughs> no. Oh, my God. So getting to the heart of our theme with the underdog stories, can you talk a little bit about the Miracle Mets and any other type of underdog stories that you came across in writing this book? Sure. Uh, well, you know, the Mets had no business whatsoever beating the established reigning world champion, by the way, Baltimore Orioles. They went three series in a row, and this was when they lost. Actually, no, they weren't the reigning. They won the following year. But, uh, uh, I mean, they played they they played a, an exemplary series. I mean, you had guys that were – you know, you see this a lot, too. Um, uh, for instance, uh, I hearken back to uh, the A's in the 70s. Were Gene Tennis. Gene Tennis had three homers all year. He hit five in a World Series. He was the MVP that year. You know, and this was a backup catcher. So you hear about things like this a lot. They come out of nowhere. Um, um, what was his name? In 68, when um oh my God. Uh, hold on, give me a sec. Oh God. Mickey Lolich. Mickey Lolich had a pretty good year. He won 17 games. But I mean, he was no Bob Gibson. Bob Gibson you know, had a 1.12 ERA. Uh, baseball, because of him and Koufax that year, they lowered the mound the next year. You know, you know how great do you have to be to, to have somebody change the game because of you? That was like Will Chamberlain in basketball, where they, they, they narrowed the paint. Um, they started to give a time frame that you could be in the paint, you know, because of him, because it was like unfair. Nobody could get close enough to score. But uh, anyway, getting back to the 68, um, Mickey Lulich beat Bob Gibson head to head. Go figure, you know? Uh, but yeah, the, the, the Mets were, um, uh, of course, being a Philly fan, I, I, I don't really like the Mets. Yeah, but, it's uh, tough. But it's you have to give to them the props about. for that one. I mean, they, they, were, they were fabulous. But the, um, the journey, as I said earlier, was arduous trying to get connections to people so I could get it into print. Uh, lucky, unlikely contacts through. I was pouring concrete one time. This guy put me in touch with an author, you know, who, who gave me tips yeah. and pointers about Amazon. So it's a story within a story, you know. It's like even to get it in print, um, you know. And of course, I don't want to make any comparisons, but I mean, Rocky was a lot like that. He wrote the story and went to the, you know, at least he got to uh you know uh the um the studios you know to, to speak to them i could never get except the, other than darns i could never get to anybody in a publishing house or an agent uh 
but at least he got to them. And when he got to them, you know, they offered him 25,000 for this, for the rights of the story. And it wasn't so much that he didn't want the money. He just wanted to star in it. So they wouldn't agree to that. So he turned the money down and, uh, you know, he was, you know, nearly destitute at the time. So his wife at the time left him. That's a shame. She must really feel foolish now because look what it turned <laughs> into. So I just hung on to my dream, man. And if it never really lights the world on fire, the fact that I got published, I'm in the Library of Congress. I know what it's like to be an author now. I have other uh, projects right behind it, ready to go. I mean, I'm, um, I'm not finished. You know, we're, we're going to continue this. That's awesome. And this, this accomplishment, like with, with this accomplishment, all that you've gone through to get there, yeah. what advice do you have for someone out there who wants to accomplish something big in their life or go after a dream, whether it's publishing their own book or maybe just running a marathon or something like that? Never, ever give up. If you feel passionate about something, never give up. Now, I'm not saying ignore the critics because they, there may be some learning from their you know, criticism, but that doesn't mean you stop. I'm sure if you talk to anybody that's successful today, they had doors slammed in their faces and just did not let it deter them. So you never, ever give up your dream. You let them tell you at the end, it's not going to happen. You just don't say, oh, well, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. Because then you're defeated. It's, you're, you're half kicked in the ass then. And what do you want people most to remember about this conversation, about you, and about your book? <laughs> Can I quote Rocky? <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's that, fitting. That, that I weren't just another bum from the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> oh man so before we wrap this up do you want to tell people how they can support everything you got going on where they can find your book and all that good stuff okay for the time being it's only available on amazon.com and uh all you have to do is in the search bar type in the title of the book world series chronology uh the subtitle is compare contrast and coordinate the champions which i've done with a lot of my research um and again like i said amazon.com um I just reduced the price and um, it's affordable. It's a great gift. If you know somebody that likes baseball, because the holiday's coming. And uh, of course, my name is kind of rare, Sal Tartaglia. And uh, to look for other projects coming out, I, uh, I want to write a book that I already have written exactly, but it's, it's in handwritten form on composition books. But uh, it's kind of lengthy and I'm sure I'm going to need breaks from that. And as soon as the holidays are over, I'm going to begin it. Um, and I think initially, well, I don't want to say the title because it could be changed, but when I need breaks from this, I have an NFL version of the book that I'm talking about now about the world series. I have an NFL version ready to go right behind it in case this catches on. I have that one ready to go. And when I need a break from the story that I'm going to, uh, um, endeavor so shortly, uh, when I take a break from that, I'll probably go ahead and do that NFL one because that could be a quick project, I think. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Yeah. So you got some stuff lined up. That's great. Well, you know, I was I had a dream at one point. I said, oh, this is going to really, you know, take off. And hopefully somebody will say, well, what other ideas you have? And, I, you know, I could do one for football. I'm not that passionate about hockey and basketball as I am about baseball and football and boxing and those. But I still have enough material in binders in my basement where I could do one for those sports, golfing, horse racing, tennis, you name it. I, I've compiled stuff over the years like nobody's business. And you can make a whole franchise out of this. You never Well, know. I would love to make a, a brand out of the World Series chronology. Like I said, that website, uh, that'll be available for sales shortly. It's not presently. But you can go to uh, either my Facebook page, World Series Book, um, There's a, and there's worldserieschronology.com, the website. And you'll see blogs and posts every day, of tidbits and information that uh, I put a different slant to. That, uh, will, like I said, more than whet the appetite of the fan and the reader. Awesome. Well, Sal, thank you so much for coming on the show, man, taking the time to share your story and this amazing book with our listeners. So I really appreciate it. All right, Tyler. I really appreciate it also. And uh, uh, if there's anything in my limited scope that I can do to help you, just reach out. Thank you so much. 
If you enjoyed listening to Sal's extensive baseball knowledge, there's plenty more where that came from in his new book, World Series Chronology. Grab yourself a copy or give it to the baseball nerd in your life as the perfect Christmas present. Thanks for listening, and always remember, Hustle and Motivate is presented by JokerMag.com, the home of the underdog.